And now I want to invite um, our chairman, who you heard from this morning, Steve Cody, chairman of the Economic Alliance, and our next speaker, Railroad Commissioner Ryan Sitton, to come back in. And I'll let Steve introduce Commissioner Ryan um, as they come back in. So in just a second, there we go. I see them popping in. All right, you two guys can unmute. And then I will turn it over there, Steve. There we go. Okay. Deal, good deal. All right. Well, welcome back in, Steve. And I'll cue it up to you to introduce our next speaker, Commissioner Ryan. Thank you, Chad. You 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 pressed us with time there, so we're we're going to have to make a run for this. So, the main thing I want to first emphasize to everybody out there is um, Commissioner Sitton plans on speaking for about 15 minutes, and then he wants to leave it open for some Q and A from all of you. So if you can, as early as you can, start submitting some questions for us so that I can review those things and I can tee them up for him uh, in the last part of this, of this segment. So just a couple of real quick things for Commissioner Sitton. He is a native Texan. He's a graduate of Texas A&M. Whoop. Oh, <laughs> I, I always have to give it a pause. Whoop. I got one Aggie in the room and he's got to say it. So uh, <laughs> he's happily married to Jennifer and father of three. He is the founder of Pinnacle Advanced Reliability Technologies that employs, you know, almost a thousand people in the oil and gas industry. Uh, for four years running, he's been an Aggie 100 recipient. He's been recognized as one of the most influential leaders in Houston. And breaking news, on November 10th, he will be releasing his first book called Crucial Decisions, which I've already gone on Amazon and pre-ordered. So if you get an opportunity, go on there and pre-order this book. And I think you're going to hear a little bit about uh, that book from this speech. And so without further ado, Commissioner Sitton, it's all you. Awesome. Thank you, Steve. It's great to be back with you. Can you all hear me? Awesome. Uh, yeah, it's great to be back. Unfortunately, I really miss doing this live in the Pasadena Convention Center. Uh, for those of you who I've had a, a, the pleasure of visiting with before, this is literally one of my favorite, might be my favorite events of the year. It's a great group. Everybody's engaged. It's concentrated in, in that kind of Eastern Harris County area in terms of we're pulling a, a cross section of industry. And I've always loved being, uh, being at that event. They do a great job, Chad, you guys do a great job putting it on. And, uh, and you've done a great job with, with this format this time. In fact, if you've seen me before, do you know that I typically don't have a problem filling up the entire you know, 45 minutes with, with words. But because we have this little bit more intimate format with this, this digital, this Zoom interaction, it'd be a good time to, to give some bold ideas and then allow folks to ask questions and get a little bit more engagement than we normally get to do. So I'm excited to do that today with everybody as well. Let me start with this. What if you had the ability to predict the future? Now, each of us every day, are, we are doing things, we are making decisions about our future based on what we know today, right? We plan our budgets. We try to figure out how much money we're going to make. We're planning for retirement. We're working with our kids, figuring out how we, what kind of grades they need to get or what kind of practice they have to, to do to get on the sports team or get into college, right? We're, we're looking at our jobs, our businesses, trying to make plans for the future. Always, we are making decisions that will affect the future based on what we know today. Now, over the last few years, we've seen examples of how changing dynamics, changing the way people look at the world around them helps them make different decisions with dramatically different results. Let's talk about a few examples of that. If you were watching uh, kind of big news in the oil business came out about two weeks ago when BP released its annual, annual corporate report about the future of energy markets. And for the first time ever, BP in its annual report said that it's possible that last year peaked oil demand. In other words, we saw more demand for oil globally in 2019 than we will ever see. That's pretty big news when one of the world's largest oil companies is forecasting that oil demand would already peaked last year and now is gonna begin the long road down. The question is, what data are they looking at? How are they making those decisions? Because when you think about how we look at decisions in front of us, whether you're talking about our budget, our careers, our businesses, our kids going to college, right? It's not just, hey, what stuff do we use to make a decision? A lot of times it's about what data do we have in front of us? And data, the way we look at data kind of comes in three packages. One, what data are we looking for? Two, 
when and how do we look at it? And three, are we sure we've got a complete set of it? Well, and BP came out a couple of weeks ago and said, well, we think that um, you know, we might have seen the global demand for oil peak last year. Let's talk about what data they might have been looking at. If, for example, we were going to do some economic analysis ourselves and we looked at United States, who is the biggest, the world's biggest energy consumer, we would have seen that the United States right now consumes 100 quadrillion BTUs of energy every year. That's a gigantic number. Most of us, it's hard to imagine the number of zeros that go after that. The world uses about 600 quadrillion BTUs of energy every year. So in other words, the United States is using about one sixth of the world's energy. And if you look at the last few years, what you'd have seen is that while oil and gas production have gone up in the United States, renewables have skyrocketed. Now, all energy production has gone up in the United States. In fact, the United States in 2005 was importing 30% of the energy that it consumed. Last year, the United States switched to be a net energy exporter. But let's go back to what's happening in terms of the future. If you are BP or, or we're trying to do some economic mark modeling, we look out, say, 30 years down the road to 2050. We said, well, what's going to happen with oil demand looking at the United States? We would have seen, if you look at the EIA or the IEA, EIA's website, the Energy Information Agency, they're projecting that the United States by 2050 will be using about 107 quadrillion BTUs per year only up between seven and 10% energy growth over a 30 year period. And if we looked at it and said, wait a minute, renewables are climbing like this and our total energy demand is staying pretty flat, you would have said, man, BP must be right. Apparently renewables is gonna take over and the demand for oil is going down. But if you looked at another set of data, you'd get a different story. If you looked at the demand for energy around the world, which is said to is today 600 quadrillion BTUs for, of energy. How much will it grow by 2050? Well, while the United States' energy demand is only growing by seven to 10%, the world's energy demand is forecasted to grow by 50%, from 600 to 900 quadrillion BTUs of energy. And if you look, well, where's that growth coming from? It's not coming from the United States or Europe, or it's not coming from the, the, the very small third world countries. It's coming out of the middle, the second world countries, think places like China and India, which are not only seeing their populations grow, they're also seeing a big transition from rural living to urban living, which as you can imagine, takes a lot more energy. So the world is gonna go from 600 quadrillion BTUs of energy to 900 quadrillion BTUs of energy. And if we say, well, how much of that will come from renewables, you know, hydrocarbons, coal, oil, gas? Well, if we were to believe that oil is going to shrink globally, then that means that almost all of that difference has to be made up with natural gas and renewables. And in fact, if you read further into some of the projections, some people are claiming renewables are gonna take all of that 300 quadrillion BTU growth. Well, if that were true, if renewables were to grow, because right now around the world, renewables make up about 100 quadrillion BTUs of energy globally, for them to go, for renewables to go from 100 to 400 quadrillion BTUs total, that would mean that renewable energy would be growing faster than all of the other energy sources on the planet have grown in the last 40 years combined. In addition, it means that every additional car over what we have in circulation today, in other words, here's a certain number of cars being used around the planet, that that any additional ones over that number have to be electric. They can't be on, based on gasoline. Short version is, I don't think BP got it right. I think that BP's projections are wrong and that oil demand is absolutely gonna climb. Now the next couple of years are gonna be rocky coming out of coronavirus, but demand for oil by 2030, 2040, and 2050, I believe is going to climb. The question is, how did BP get it wrong? They were looking at the wrong data. Well, let's take another example. If you had retired from your company, retired from your job in say 2007, 2008, you would have gone to your financial person. And your financial person said, you know where we might wanna put your money. Let's say you had a million dollars in retirement all coming in one big swath. The retirement guy may have said, you know what we should do? We should put your money into the real estate market because the real estate market is growing in leaps and bounds. Now you being a judicious thinker may have said, wait a minute, 
man, this thing's been growing like crazy. I've been hearing concerns it might be a bubble. And he said, no, 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 you don't understand. You see, the demand for housing is going up so much that the price of housing is going up. Therefore, the market is in demand. And you would say, wait a minute, man, I keep hearing about these subprime mortgage things. I mean, aren't those a concern? I'm not even sure what those mean, and I'm concerned. He's, he says, wait a minute, it's all right, let me explain. He says, see, because the demand for housing is going up, and the, therefore, the price of housing is going up, even if somebody defaults on their mortgage, the bank is left with a house that's worth more than the guy bought it for, which means it's low risk. And when you combine all of these loans together, you have a low risk asset, great investment. Now, if you were still wondering at this point, man, I don't know, then you were in a minority because probably 95% of the investment group out there, investment people out there were saying poor money in the housing market. Well, if you've seen the movie or you've read the book, The Big Short, you know, there were a few financial minds that were looking at that market saying something doesn't smell right. In fact, what they figured out was something that most of the financial world missed. It wasn't that the demand for housing was causing some pro, was making subprime mortgage lending possible. It was subprime mortgage lending that increased the demand for housing. In the end, in 2009, we know that the housing crisis started, housing prices around the country fell anywhere between five and 50%, depending on where you lived. A lot of banks, a lot of people lost, lost millions, even hundreds of millions of dollars, companies went bankrupt. All, not because they weren't looking at the wrong data, they were looking at the right data. They were looking at it the wrong way. Another story I'll share with you. As you know, I'm a Texas Railroad Commissioner, which is a statewide elected position. And this year I was up for re-election. In December, I ran a poll. And the poll said that in the primary, which was March 3rd, I was up. In other words, I had a lead of like 56, 57, 43. Man, a good commanding 15 point lead. Been around this office for a long time, out engaging, doing things like this. March 3rd was election day. In March 3rd, I was in Houston, but I had to be in Austin the day after. And in fact, I was, had a meeting that evening that ended around five o'clock. And as I was leaving that meeting, you know, election results would be coming in that night. And people were asking me, Ryan, you know, should we be concerned about this election? And I acted like, no, it's formality. We've got good data. So I left Houston Thursday, uh, Tuesday night, March 3rd, driving to Austin, thinking that this was a formality. By the time I got to Austin that night, I had lost the election. You see, what I had done is I had run polling data in December, in January, and based on that polling data, everything looked good. But what I didn't take into account was the week before early voting started, a really nasty, just salacious website went up. And even though we kind of did some, did some checking, talked around, didn't seem like it was getting a lot of spread, I mean, everyone knew, anyone who saw it was like, that's a, a, there's a pictures claiming the things about Ryan, that's not even Ryan, it was an obvious, it's almost a joke. Well, sure enough, after the election results had come in, we polled, found out that about 10% of the voters did see that website, went a little bit viral and cost me the election. So I had the right data and I was looking at it the right way. I was looking at it at the wrong time. So what does this mean to us today? I mean, as we're going through the realities of the world that we're in and, and coronavirus fears and trying to process change in market conditions and retail changes and real estate changes and everybody working from home. What's happening is we are being fed information constantly, so much so that it's overload. And let me put it to you this way. I'm 45 years old and I believe that the greatest opportunities of our lifetime are happening right now. Because with all of these changes, with all of this turmoil, the world is going through changes at a faster pace than ever before, or at least certainly in our lifetime. And the opportunity for leaders, whether you're in big corporations, you're in small business, here with your family, working with your children, in your community, elected officials, is to read the tea leaves in better ways than we have before. How do we use data, not just, not just using little glimpses, but using it in ways that, we have, that, we've, that we've never done it before. How do we look for insights that we might have missed in, a prior, in, in, in prior analyses? Let's use a baseball example. If you've seen the movie Moneyball, you know that in the early 2000s, Billy Bean, as the general manager of the o Oakland Athletics, was stuck with a problem. His budget was less than one-tenth of the New York Yankees, and he had to go field a team trying to use this really limited budget. And he brings in 
an economic, a, a guy with a degree in economics from, I think it was Stanford, who comes in, helps him do analytics to pick players that a lot of teams had passed on because they didn't, they had goofy arm swings or they had weird, uh, they, they had weird histories in terms of their, 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 their teams they'd been on. When it came down to it, what Billy Bean worried about was, do they get on base? And by breaking it down to simple data, they were able to field a team that set a new record for the longest winning streak in the American League with the second lowest payroll in baseball. How we use data to make decisions is going to be how we shape the world in front of us. So let me give one last example and then I'll open it up for some questions here today. Coronavirus has thrown our entire economy for a loop and the question will be how do we learn lessons from all of this, from all the things we've been through in the last year. And I'm going to unpack one specific period for you. Now March 3rd was election day. By two weeks later, I, when I lost the election, two weeks later we were talking about lockdown. By the end of March, man, the, the country, the state was in lockdown. And the question is, we will look back, and we're doing some, some analysis today, and as we look back in the future, I think what we're going to, to realize is that we were looking at the wrong data, at the wrong times, and in the wrong ways. What do I mean by that? At the end of the day, what thing have we talked about the most? The single piece of data we've used to drive public opinion, public decision, has been the number of coronavirus cases. But the fact is, that's, that by itself may not be a very telling metric. In fact, let me tell, say this, you know, my mother is, has Alzheimer's and she's living in a, in a facility. She's 76 years old. She is one of the highest risk people because as a result of Alzheimer's, she doesn't eat well enough and she's, you know, her, her body is in failing health. She's super high risk. And so as we take measures to try to limit the spread of coronavirus, she is one of the, the people who will benefit the most and are trying to protect her from these risks. The question is, how, is how, how are the things we are doing affecting these numbers? Well, if you'd have gone that back to middle of March and you said, okay, we're going to go into a super hard lockdown, shut down restaurants, shut down bars, everyone's working from home, companies. Well, of course, as we all know, we plunged the U.S. government and the United States into an economic downturn, the likes of which we really had never seen before in that period of time. At one point, 25 million Americans had lost their jobs. And by the time we got to the end of May, so you know, basically two months the total number of people, total number of cases that had been tested was around, was around 1.7 million. So at the time we said, okay, we got to start opening up again because man, our, our economy is, has been slammed here. This, this can't last. We were asking the questions, okay, well, we got to reopen and, and let's see if we'd limited the spread. Well, of course, as we opened, the spread had happened because less than 2%, less than, sorry, less than 1% of the population had, had actually had coronavirus. In hindsight, it seems obvious that it was going to spread again. In fact, at this point, we, we went to more limited measures, right? Not, not locked down totally, but a little bit. What if we'd have done that just two months earlier instead of the total lockdown? We probably would be about where we are today, but we would have cost ourselves $5 trillion less in government debt, economic shutdown, and job losses. So the, the reaction to bad data hits us in hard ways. And those of us who lead by looking at data in bold ways and reading into what it really means are those who have the ability to drive our, our economy, our businesses, and our communities into the future. That's the bold idea I want to leave you with today. So Steve, what questions do we have? All right, Ryan. I mean, Commissioner Sitton, uh, I got I like a couple Ryan. of different things that have come up. And, uh, and so, and really based on your example of the VP's use of data and the timing, like in your campaign, a question came up in regards to, do you feel the rise of data scientists and artificial intelligence is the best way to process multiple streams of data? Great question. And um, in fact, I'll say this, the, the rise of data science is, is kind of a nebulous term. Let me, let me get into some granular. What does that really mean? Really, all, we've been doing data science and data analytics literally for 100 years, right? When Commodore Vanderbilt and John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie became the richest men in the world with a locomotive, a, an oil and a steel empire, they were looking at data, right? They were looking at growth in population, the strength of steel, the amount of energy out of oil, and the, the cost of moving products via locomotives. So data analytics is not new. There's a lot of kind of chatter these days about what's happening with computers. Are they doing more sophisticated analytics? Yes is the answer. And in complex systems, 
absolutely the ability to do data analytics in a, in a faster and a more sophisticated way is huge. That doesn't mean you have to have a degree in data science. Now that said, I will tell myself, I am back in school for the first time in 20 years of studying to get my PhD in data science, but not because I believe that I have to have that, but there are some nuances I wanna learn about research and about how we apply data science specifically in software so that I can lead our company Pinnacle into the next decade with our customers who are you know, large complex facilities. But as we think about solving problems, yes, is the answer to your question. Looking at how we combine data with experts into a sphere. So if you think of this is, this is all the data I need to make a quantitative decision. Where in other words, to the point where I almost don't have to make a decision, the data makes the decision for me. I fill that in either with actual data, with expert opinion, with assumptions, with some calculations. So as we think about that, that's really where quote unquote data science becomes a reality for most of us is thinking less about just having to make the call based on what I hear in social media or the real media or what's happening in the world, going down to what data do I have, what's key to make this decision, what expert opinion can tell me and what it can't, and then what calculations can I run? So it's really about getting deeper and deeper into looking at the data I have, not just kind of throwing it over the fence to some calculator to do some math. That's where I think the power will come and how we make those decisions. Okay, um, next question is, how many wins will the Aggie? Oh, I'm, I'm, no, never mind. That was, that was <laughs> an unqualified uh, question. Um, the next question really has to do with, you know, again, going back to data, um, similar to like what BP uh, asked or used, is promoting going to a zero carbon footprint realistic? <laughs> That's a good question. Is it realistic? Yes, depending on the timeline you are talking about. If I said, hey, we wanna be at a zero carbon footprint, i.e. we put a net zero amount of CO2 into the atmosphere by say 2030 in 10 years, it's absolutely not realistic. In fact, it's impossible. There is not enough infrastructure industry, there's not enough ability in the world to make that possible in any sort of practical way. Now, if you look out, you know, 2050, 2060, 2070, it's possible. However, I will tell you the biggest obstacle of that today is that you've got two political camps that operate like this. You've got, you've got one political camp that says, hey, absolutely, mankind is 100% responsible for all global warming, all climate change, and if you don't accept that fact, then you're a climate denier. You've got another camp that says, uh, mankind has nothing to do with, with any climate change, zero impact on the, on the world, and in fact, all, everyone who doesn't think that's a bunch of liberal whack jobs. The fact is, mankind does have an impact on climate change. We know it, it's a fact. And the climate is changing, we know that, it's a fact. What we don't know is the degree to which mankind is having an impact. And whether or not, and, and, and while we explore that more, one other thing is true. The fact is, even if mankind is having a little bit, a lot, some, the fact is we do need to be prepared for the fact that the climate is changing, right? Even if mankind was doing nothing, the climate would be changing. And to go into it hoping that simply, this is what you'll hear from one side of the political aisle, is just to shut down all oil and gas companies, everything will be fine. Of course, that's not true. And our, our entire society would devolve into, into you know, basic agrarian living if we tried to do that. That, that still ignoring the other things we need to do to be prepared for climate change that is happening is, is missing, the, sort of, is missing the, the forest for the trees. The second thing is, as we think about energy technology, think about things like, solar and wind and the cost of those and how to integrate those in sophisticated grids. We've got, we, there is a lot more to do in terms of developing that technology and rolling it out, but it's gonna take time and it's gonna have to take real good engineering and real good strategy. And right now we're missing the opportunity to do that because of the two political factions that are, that are battling over votes in primaries. I advocate for, and I believe in, us developing long-term strategies where the United States leads on this, not by simply trying to shut down oil and gas, but say, let's be really excellent at oil and gas. Let's help these developing nations who wanna use energy to raise the standard of living in their world by letting them use oil and natural gas, just like we did, but also setting all of us up to leverage any energy technology that's coming, coming online today and into the future. You know, it's interesting with all the data and the talk about bad data and, and you know, you can get an angle any way you want if you have enough data. And, uh, is, and, and I hate to use the word regulate, but is there a way you can regulate bad data versus 
data reports or that, you know, just to avoid inaccurate reports causing a community or an industry to suddenly do something different, similar to the pandemic. Is, is, do you think there's any way in the future of doing something like that? Absolutely, Steve. In fact, I will tell you this. Um, it's a great question and it, and it speaks to sort of one of the fundamental challenges of our society. Whether you are talking about healthcare or education or energy or infrastructure, at the end of the day, right now, the way a lot of decisions are made is based on getting a lot of people together, hearing a lot of different opinions and trying to find compromise in the middle. Well, just because you get a lot of people together doesn't mean you're coming up with the right solution. In fact, often group think can, if any of us who run a business, we get group think going in a room can actually arrive at the wrong decision because behavioral economics teaches us that the bias for social acceptance is stronger than our bias for analytical thinking. And so what I mean is often looking at, when we look at how do we improve, for example, our education system to be what we need it to be for future generations in the United States, man, that's actually a data problem. In other words, what am I really trying to do? Is it really about it's really, my, my kids, by the way, are all in public school in Texas right now. I got a 16 year old, a 14 year old, 11 year old. My parents taught school. My dad taught public school in Texas for 44 years. I graduated from a public university. I'm a proud participant in the public school system. But if we want our, our school system to provide the opportunities, not in getting a degree, but in preparing children, giving them education, giving them knowledge that they can use to be a valuable member of society, maybe time to evolve teaching practices, a lot of which look today exactly like they did 100 years ago. And so how we do that is a data problem. In other words, where will kids of today, where will they need to have knowledge to be the leaders of 20 and 30 and 40 years from now? What skills do they need to have and how can they get those in the most rapid ways? Let's talk about kids like me who were ADD who really struggle in the classroom and that specific type of learning lecture style doesn't suit them. But there are other learning styles that do that suit them a lot. I told you, I'm going back to school right now. I'm in my first class in my PhD program. And as I'm listening to the teacher lecture on how you can code in Python to do data visualizations, I struggle. As soon as I start, look, as soon as I start playing with it and trying it myself, I learn a lot faster. Well, that's all, we can get data around that. So the point is, regardless of what, what political challenge or economic challenge or, or um, community challenge we're talking about, and let's use regulation in there, driving towards specific, specific analysis and specific data to help us measure performance will help all of us get past the sort of political dynamic and more to clear objectives that we can all wrap our heads around. And I think, I, I think that is the future of our, our economy, our businesses, and our society. Very good. I mean, it, it really seems um, like an opportunity for yourself and for all those in the industry that would benefit from the very fact that you lost your election. Uh, you know, the fact that uh, you're so passionate about our industry, um, it, it's driving you to go back to school. Uh, you're giving back to the industry for a lot of this, um, for a lot of the data science is going to be hugely beneficial for everybody in this industry. Um, for so much time to come. Um, I'm just looking through some different questions and you've kind of answered most of them through that. Why don't we, um, why don't you give us a prediction on Texas A&M? Are they going to have a 10 win, 10 win season this year? <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> now, this is not good data. Do you this, have the this data? Goes the, this goes into the camp of, of, of conjecture, right? This is not, this is like, ex, not even expert. This is just two-bit opinion. Uh, yeah, I'm going to predict an eight and two season for the Aggies this year. You know, we got all SEC games. We only got 10 games this year. So if we can get to, to, to eight wins, heck, nine wins would be awesome. Eight wins, I think, will be a, a decent year for us this year. Well, that's yeah, yeah. I'm going to I'm going to second that opinion, Ryan. Thank you very much. We'll go eight and two. We'll, we'll take that. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, U of H just scheduled something with Baylor. I was hoping they'd get something with the Aggies or somebody like that, but we'd probably be embarrassed very quickly. So <laughs> good deal. Thank you, Commissioner Sitton. Really appreciate your time. Really appreciate all the, all that you're doing for industry and uh, uh, look forward to many more endeavors in the future that uh, for you and your family. Well, thank you, Steve. It's good to see you again, Chad. It's good to be with you and everybody who's online. Uh, hopefully we are back. I have actually joked that I've said that in general, I think that um, a lot of 
these sort of big industry events, trade shows are really going to be down probably for a long time. But Chad, as I've said before, yours is one of my favorite. You always have a great lineup. Um, you've you got a great group. So uh, I hope to be back in the convention center with you next year. Well, we really appreciate it. And we thank you for your consistency and coming in to the conference and, and providing, you know, this great information. Um, you know, we're lucky to have you. Uh, we really appreciate it. We could let you go for 30 more minutes if we didn't jam up the rest of the, uh, the agenda. So uh, appreciate your time, Steve. Thanks for helping uh, moderate that. Um, with that, we'll let you two guys uh, jump off. I know, uh, Steve, we'll see you back in a little bit. Ryan, you take care.